Good morning, folks, and welcome to Albert Street Uniting Church this morning. My name is Peter Hobson. I'm the superintendent minister here at Albert Street Uniting Church, Wesley Mission, Queensland. And on behalf of my colleague, Reverend Mel Willey and myself, welcome to worship, whether you're here in this space or participating online. For those of us here in Brisbane this morning, it's been somewhat of a challenge to get here. You've had to endure the cooler weather, which we're not all that comfortable with at times. Road closures, for those of us who have to come from uh, the west to here, we had to detour right around the whole city in order to get in. Um, we, have, of course, have COVID restrictions. And so throughout the service, we'd ask you to, to keep your masks on. We will have singing, and you can sing or hum or uh, whatever you want to do underneath your mask. The rest of us aren't going to know, but we will be having singing throughout the service if you wish to participate. For those who are up the front, um, and we have re reduced the number of people for today's service because of the COVID restrictions, but there still are some people participating. Uh, we would ask you to take your mask off while you're speaking and then put your mask back on when you return to your seat. Um, so with all of that as well, of course, there are many of us who are maybe a bit weary this morning after watching Ash Barty and uh, Dylan Alcott win the Wimbledon titles. It's, I can't remember the last time two Australians had, uh, had singles titles at Wimbledon, which was wonderful. Uh, and a reminder to everyone, of course, you should have checked in using the Queensland app on your way in this morning. Um, that's now mandated across Queensland. Um, so please make sure, if you haven't done that already, that you do that on your way out. And we also have the very talented David Jones playing organ for us this morning. Uh, Greg, our regular organist, is um, isolating on his island home in, uh, in the bay. Uh, he hopes to join us next Sunday. So thank you very much, David, for helping us out this morning. Let us begin. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. So come let us worship with joy and with thanksgiving. Who can enter the holy presence of God? Come let us worship with humility and with faithfulness. Let us lift our hearts for God is here. Come, Come let, let us, us worship, worship together in, in spirit, spirit and, and in, in truth. truth. Let us pray. We give you thanks, Creator God, for the land on which we meet. From time beyond our reckoning, the traditional custodians of this land, the Yagara and the Turrbal people, have lived in harmony with their environment and have nurtured this land with a deep and abiding care. We give you thanks for their stewardship. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And we also give thanks for the multitudes who have recently arrived here from many different cultures and countries and who now call this place home. Help us, O oh God, to live together in fellowship, to share our stories of hope and of justice and of peace and to further the work of reconciliation in this land. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the lectionary readings today, we have two tales of two kings and two dancers. So much in common, and yet the stories could not be more different. One tells the story of a king whose very heart is after God, Scripture tells us, and the other of a king whose heart seems to be missing. One tells the story of a dance to glorify God that shamed the king, and another of a dance that sought glory and brought death. One tells of a king whose intimacy with God was prized above all else, and the other tells of a palace of corruption where intimacy and loyalty were bought and sold, and life itself was pretty cheap. Each story is separated by more than a thousand years, and yet both are as contemporary as a current affair or four corners in relation to how the world around us is depicted. For the stories themselves aren't really about kings and dancers at all, but rather about the very heart of the human condition. What is the cost of worshipping God? What is the price of following Jesus? In the end, what are we willing to pay and how can we possibly afford it? May God be with you. And also with you. We light the Christ candle this morning to remind us that Jesus is the light of the world and in him there is no darkness. Let us shine the light of God's love to the ends of the earth. Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Uh, 
Our first hymn this morning, Jesus Calls Us Here to Meet Him. Please stand as you are able. Jesus calls us here to meet Him as through word and song and prayer. We affirm God's promised presence where His people live in heaven. Praise the God who keeps His promise. Praise the Son who calls us friends. Praise the Spirit who among us to our hopes and fears attends. Jesus calls us to confess Him words of life and Lord of all, sharer of our flesh and frailness, saving all who fail or fall. Tell his holy human story, tell his tales that all may hear. Tell the world that Christ in glory came to us. to each other found in him are no divides race and class and sex and language such are barriers he derides join the hand of friend and stranger join the hands of age and youth join the faithful and Outer in their common search for truth. Please be seated. Let's pray now our prayer of adoration and confession. Let us pray. Loving God, forgive us for the times when we speak in ways that cause injury to others, for being insensitive, for being mean for being thoughtless. Forgive us for the times when we fail to listen, for assuming things or ignoring things rather than paying attention. Forgive us for the times when we act selfishly, for looking after our own desires instead of showing kindness and care towards each other. In this time of silence, we bow our heads and we humble ourselves before you. Help us to remain true to your ways, the way of justice and compassion and of peace. Amen. Friends, hear the good news, news that seems too good to be true. By the grace of God found in Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. I invite you to stand, as is our practice, hand over heart, masks on, um, and greet each other, those around you, with the peace of Christ. Thank you, folks. Grab a seat. It's wonderful to, I was going to say, see your smiling faces. That's not entirely correct. I can't see your smiling faces, but wonderful to see you here this morning. Your smiling eyes. There it is. Wonderful to see your smiling eyes here this morning. Last week, of course, we were uh, online, and um, that was an interactive service. We had uh, people commenting on the chat room and sharing uh, prayer needs. We had people participating from all different locations uh, across the city. Uh, it was the first time we'd done a, a live Zoom church service and special thank you to Mel for organising all of that and running the control room. And, uh, and a special thank you to St Ian Chasling who was out the front here while that service was on uh, greeting some people who had come to, 
to church, uh, not aware that the service was online. So to all those involved, happy snaps. You all did very well. We're very grateful. Um, it's very good to be back here, of course, in person this morning. Um, and I, I think we just need to be reminding people if this is a, a live situation. If we've seen what's happening in New South Wales uh, with people in intensive care now due to COVID, including a, a, a teenager, um, we just need to be very careful. So we're hopeful that we'll be back there at this point. The announcements from Queensland Health is that uh, on this Friday at 6 p.m. restrictions will be lifted. But of course, things could change between now and then. We will keep everyone updated as we know through uh, the, our email updates. Um, but please be attentive and maintain restrictions as, as best we can for our own health and well-being and the health and well-being of others. So after the service this morning, we won't be having morning tea next door. We hope to be able to bring that back next week if restrictions have eased. Um, but we invite everyone to join us across the road at the Goldfinch Cafe. Um, that is open and it's an opportunity for us. When sitting at table having a coffee, you, we are allowed to take our masks off. So we'll be able to, to um, have some fellowship over there if, if we can. Uh, thank you to everyone who has brought either bank blankets or cash donations. It has enabled us to, to help emergency relief in Fortitude Valley to distribute new blankets, especially during this time of COVID restrictions, new blankets to people who are sleeping rough, um, who don't have a warm bed to sleep in, and that has been greatly appreciated. Uh, tomorrow morning at 7 a.m., we invite you all to, to join us online. The Zoom link has been shared with everyone in our email group. Uh, it's 7 a.m. on a Monday morning. There's no better way to start the week than to do so in prayer. Uh, it, we have a, a weekly devotion that, that a volunteer brings each week, and then we have some time in prayer for our community, um, our church community, our wider community, and the world at large. And it's a, a wonderful time of prayer and fellowship all online. If you have any uh, questions around that, please see the ministry team after the service. If you'd like to know more about that, we can certainly help you with that. Uh, Open Church won't be returning this Friday because of restrictions, but our hope is it will be the Friday after. Uh, we have volunteers all lined up, ready to go, and that service will also include communion, uh, which is, I'm sure, going to be a welcome return for some of the people who work here in the city. Um, it'll take a while for things to get back to how they were, and, and to be honest, I don't think they will get back to how they were. They'll get back to a new way of doing Open Church, uh, we're looking forward to being able to, to offer that service and that ministry to the people of the CBD. Last Thursday, during NAIDOC week, we had a wonderful panel with the Cooperative Hill Country, had about 70 people online um, participating with that. Special thank you to, to Dr. Janice McRandall and for the panelists for helping us to participate uh, during NAIDOC week and that's such a valuable panel that talks about the theme of of uh, NAIDOC week this year, Heal Country. And it's been wonderful to see the different community events that have happened around our nation during this time. And of course, culminating, I'm not sure if this was part of the NAIDOC planning, but Ash Barty, a very proud Aboriginal woman taking out the Wimbledon title, 40 years since um, Yvonne Goolagong, another uh, wonderful uh, Aboriginal sportswoman from this country, um, 40 years since uh, since. Um, Yvonne Gulagong's uh, uh, title and of course she was a mentor for Ash Barty as well so it was a wonderful way to wrap up NAIDOC week. Coming up on July the 31st in about what's that, three weeks time um, we're having a special Queensland Community Alliance training day here at uh, Wesley House. Uh, Wesley Mission Queensland and the Queensland Center of the United Church are both proud members of the Queensland Community Alliance which is a wonderful uh, advocacy group bringing together uh, churches uh, and, and faith communities from across the, the faith spectrum, uh, union groups and community groups to come together to ask the question, what does it mean uh, to be a good society? And uh, to advocate to government at a state level around the needs of people in local community areas. If you want to know more about that or want to become part of this training, please uh, talk to the ministry team and we will help you with your inquiries. And we hope to get back 
to uh, next Sunday, if we're able to take our masks off, to get back to the final Sunday in our church, in our preaching series of uh, Songs of Wonder. Our last congregational behaviour that we wish to address is care and compassion, and we'll have our church service here, and then at morning tea, we'll be able to to finalise that time of conversation and questions around what it means to be a community of care and compassion. We'll now have our first scripture reading. Our Old Testament lesson today comes from the book of Samuel. David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. David and all the people with him set out and went from Baalzebar to bring up from there the Ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of Hosts, who is enthroned on the cherubim. <coughs> Excuse me. They carried the Ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the Ark of God, and Ahio went in front of the Ark. David and all the house of Israel were dancing before the Lord with all their might, with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of obed Adam to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed an ox and a fatling. David danced before the Lord with all his might. David was girded with a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. As the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. They brought in the ark of the Lord and set it on its place, inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and offerings of well-being before the Lord. When David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the offerings of well-being, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts and distributed food among all the people, the whole multitude of Israel, both men and women, to each a cake of bread a portion of meat and a cake of raisins. Then all the people went back to their homes. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Our Gospel reading today comes from Mark chapter 6, verses 14 to 29. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah, and others said, it is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John bound him and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish and I will give it. 
And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you, even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? She replied, The head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for the other guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, bought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Thanks Thanks be to God. Please stand as we are able as we sing our next hymn this morning, Beauty for Brokenness. Oh 
salvation and bring you their praise. God of the poor, friend of the weak, give us compassion, we pray. Melt our cold hearts, let tears fall like rain. Come cleanse our love from our spark to our flame. Please be seated. Let us pray. God, as we gather on this morning, as the stories of Scripture dwell within us, stories of dance, stories of celebration, stories of mourning, help us to find your word for our community this day. May there be more of you and less of me in the words that I speak. But above all, God, may you speak. And may you help us to listen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, folks, I, I want to begin this morning with a disclaimer. I have never danced naked in church. There, I've said it. Might sound like an unusual way to begin a message, and yet the story that we have from the Old Testament speaks of a time where the king of Israel danced naked before God, before the 30,000 soldiers victorious in, in battle and before the court wanting to rejoice. Now, the, the Hebrew text mentions that David is wearing an ephod, which is like a, a very thin priestly apron. It doesn't say that's all that he's wearing, but there is a couple of verses later on the story where Michal, David's wife, chastises him for uncovering himself before the maidens of the court. We shouldn't be too surprised by that because later on in the story we discover that David has a tendency to uncover himself before other women, sometimes married women, it gets him into a bit of trouble. But it's a surprising story of the king of Israel dancing naked before God, before the gathered community. I have at times danced in church, but I have been fully clothed. Back in my old Pentecostal days, we all danced in church, did the old two-step, twirled around a few times, cartwheels up and down the aisles, worship was vibrant and fun and full of life. I have danced naked before in the shower. Back as a teenager, it was fully choreographed rock concerts back in those days, but that's, that's been a while. This whole idea of response to the blessings and presence of God being something that inhabits our body, something that's raw and honest and alive and joyful and perhaps even offensive, all at the same time. Within our Albert Street tradition, we probably don't dance as much in our gathered times of worship, but when the masks are removed, we are known as a congregation who will lift its voice in song during our hymns. I wonder what that experience is like for you. A response to the blessings of God in our worship time? Is it something that you feel in your body? Do you get goosebumps as you sing and the organs playing and, and as a community in one voice we are worshipping? Certainly in my former Pentecostal days, worship was constantly a goosebump experience. We talked about this a few weeks ago, that that joyful response to God in worship can be a wonderful thing, it can also be an addictive thing at times. And we also talked about this idea that God requires more from us than simply singing. 
or dancing. Even though, even though these occasions of song and dance can be truly wonderful. What is our bodily response to the blessings of God in our worship? This text from the Old Testament is complex and there are many different layers to this story. We find in the lectionary a a part of the story has been omitted. And I'd encourage you to go back home and if you were participating online to to turn to this passage in uh, in Samuel and, and read what happens here. After the ark has first been recovered and the, the army is celebrating, as the ark is being transported back to Jerusalem, it falters on the cart and, and one of the, the carers of the ark reaches out a hand to steady the ark and, is, and God strikes this person dead. Sometimes our bodily response in worship, as well-intentioned as it might be, can have tragic consequences. How do we respond to the blessings of God? Especially in this time of COVID where we uh, have social distancing and restrictions. And even today we're gathered together in this place wearing masks. Do you find that your response to God is restricted because of it? What are some ways as a community that we can bypass or, or overcome these things that are important these restrictions for our health and well-being, what are some other ways that we can respond to the joy that God has brought into our lives? Ways that can be spontaneous, ways that can be life-giving, ways that fill our bodies with joy. This idea of dancing before God. We've all seen those memes and posters, dance as though no one's looking at you. For David, as he's dancing in response to the blessings of God in his life, he seems blissfully unaware of anyone who might be looking because his dance is not something that he assumes people are gazing upon. His dance is simply his body projecting outwards the joy that is there within. In our New Testament reading, we see another dance, very different to this one. And it's framed around this story that speaks to us of John the Baptist's demise. John the Baptist is introduced to us at the beginning of Mark's Gospel. Matthew and Luke begin their Gospel accounts with these wonderful genealogies and stories of the miraculous birth of Jesus. John begins his Gospel account with this poetic prologue about the Logos being at creation itself. Mark begins with a prophecy about John. John is right there at the beginning, paving the way for Jesus. The character of John is essential to the story of Jesus as it unfolds in the Gospel account. And if we go back to Mark chapter 1, we find that as soon as John introduces Jesus to the story, he's arrested. That's all we know. John is arrested and the second half of that verse is where Jesus brings the good news for the first time. Jesus speaks and proclaims that the gospel has come into the world and we should repent. We don't hear about John from that point. We don't understand why he's arrested. We have no idea of what happens after his arrest until we come to Mark chapter 6. And at the beginning of the story of John's arrest, we read this, and this is what we read last week, Jesus sends the disciples out in pairs, so they went out and proclaimed all that all should repent. It's the same message that Jesus had in Mark chapter 1. Now Jesus is telling the disciples to, to share this message. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. It's, that's how we left the gospel reading last week. And then in verse 30, the disciples come back to Jesus, they gather around Jesus and they told him all that they had done and taught. Jesus sends the disciples out to share the good news and then they come back and tell him all the wonderful things that happened. 
But sandwiched in between these two verses is the story of John the Baptist. It's like a cut and paste that is inserted into the story of Mark chapter 6. In fact, scholars call it the Markan sandwich. The story of John the Baptist is sandwiched between the disciples going out and the disciples coming back. Chronologically, of course, it may not have happened then. It may have happened way back when John was first arrested. We don't know. It seems a very curious place to insert the story of John the Baptist. Maybe Mark is trying to tell us something here. Be careful, folks. If you follow the teachings of Jesus, if you bring good news to the poor, welcoming the outcast, proclaiming the coming kingdom of God, you may just lose your head. Be careful, folks. The good news of Jesus Christ, when we embody it, when we respond to it, can be joyful and exhilarating and life-giving, but can also be offensive. And it also comes with a cost. So let's dig into this story a bit and find out exactly what's going on. Why has John lost his head How do you respond to the blessings of God? Well, for John the Baptist, he couldn't help but proclaim the good news of God, which included the justice that God demands of all people, including those who happen to live in palaces. Herod the Great, the Herod that was alive when Jesus was born, had uh, 14 children to 10 different wives. Um, his reading of the Old Testament allowed him to have more than one wife. And remember, back in these days, of course, uh, being married had nothing to do with romance. This was centuries before Pride and Prejudice. Uh, marriages were always arranged, and it was always about power and politics. Ten different wives, 14 children. These are the four sons that have um, relevance to this story. Herod the Great was the Herod at the who was alive when Jesus was born. He's very famous in the Gospel accounts because of the census that happens and also in, in Luke's Gospel and also the, the massacre of the innocents in Matthew's Gospel. Some scholars would say that the massacre of the infants, infants all those children under the age two who were slaughtered, there's no other record in history that, that talks about that happening at that time. And some scholars would say it may be that the gospel writer is making an inference here of Herod massacring all these children because Herod killed many of his own children. It was not out of character for Herod to do such a thing. And perhaps the gospel writers are making a, a sideways glance there, another sideways glance to what happened in the story of Moses. But I don't want to get sidetracked too much simply to say that Herod the Great was a great builder he was also a puppet king of Rome and he was not well loved by his people. He was known as a tyrannical ruler. The, the other Herod that we know of in the story of Jesus, Herod Antipas, is the Herod that was al alive when Jesus was crucified. Two different Herods, they're, in fact they're all called Herod, we're just calling them different names here so we can differentiate them all. But these are the four sons that Herod had that a part of this story, Aristolobus had a daughter, Herodias. She was Herod and Tippas's niece. Um, Aristobulus, wherever you pronounce his name, he was, uh, he was executed for treason against his father, along with a number of other sons that Herod the Great got rid of as well. Um, and then Herodias was married off to the Herod that Mark calls Philip. He's not known as Philip in other accounts, but in Mark's gospel, he's, he's called Philip. They got married, um, and they had a daughter, uh, Salome. So um, Herodias was not only Herod Antipas' niece, but also his sister-in-law. Later on in the story... Philip is uh, demoted because of another treasonous plot um, to kill Herod the Great, and Herodias divorce, is divorced from him. Again, 
none of this is Herodias' choice. This is all about the politics of power and trying to land grab and maintain a line of succession for Herod the Great and to also the politics of Rome in trying to make sure that Roman rule is governed throughout the area. Herodias in all of this is passed around um, like a piece on a chessboard. So then we come to this part of the story where Herod Antipas marries Herodias, his niece and his sister-in-law, and Salome becomes his stepdaughter. I thought, I, I'm in a, um, a blended family. Uh, I've been married before and have three children, and my wife has three children of previous marriage. I thought our family life was a bit complicated at times. Um, could you imagine the court that is happening here um, when all of this is taking place? In the middle of all of this, John the Baptist stands up and says, uh, this is wrong. You cannot take your brother's uh, wife as your wife. You cannot marry your niece. Marriage has some, is something more than the politics of power. Marriage is something more than arranging pieces on a chessboard. And John the Baptist is saying, if, if the words of God are for the people in the community to follow, then they also for the people in the palace to follow. And it seems that Herod and Antipas liked having John the Baptist around. He, he liked the, the words of the prophet, perhaps a little bit like a king might like to have a jester in the court. It's one thing to like the words of the prophet, it's another to hear the words of the prophet and to understand that they also speak to you. When we look at these two stories, there is a hermeneutic happening here of money, sex, and power. When, and, and these are good, helpful lenses sometimes when we read stories in Scripture. These stories that look like they're, they're out of a soap opera or out of some sort of B-grade movie are stories that are repeated each and every day. We, we read of them in our Facebook feeds, we hear of them on the news channels. These same things are happening each and every day today. Relationships that are forged and broken, alliances that are, that are forged and broken, wars that are, are fought, all because of money, sex, and power. And it's not that money, sex, and power are bad things. They can be wonderful things, a good thing for us as a community and as individuals, but when they are abused or misunderstood or, have, or serve our own selfish needs, then it all goes astray. In the story of David, David's dance, spontaneous, beautiful bodily response to the blessings of God offends others. In our New Testament story, a dance, a dance that is meant to be a time of celebration and joy is turned into an occasion where someone's life is taken. I wonder, rather than looking at money, sex and power as the hermeneutic for these stories, I wonder what happens if we look at how people have responded to the Word of God in these stories. I wonder if we look at these stories as stories of courage, stories of honesty, stories of faithfulness. It takes courage for Herodias to speak out. She's been married off to all these different kings, moved around on the chessboard. It takes courage for her to speak out, to find voice, to, find, to look for justice for her and her daughter. It takes courage for David to strip down and to dance as though no one is looking at him. It takes courage for Michal to speak out against the king. She knows that sometimes David disrobes more than he should. It takes courage for John the Baptist to speak out against Herod, to proclaim God's justice. It takes courage for all of his characters to, to find a way of faithfulness. It's Herod who lacks the courage, who lacks the conviction, who lacks the faithfulness. Imagine taking 
a person's life because you don't want to look bad in front of your dinner guests. And yet those decisions are made each and every day in the palaces and the boardrooms of the the nation and in the world in which we live. What is our response to the blessings of God in our life? Courage, honesty, faithfulness. How do we embody the joy of the gospel such that we are willing to go out into the world to proclaim good news, that we might be ready to dance, not that others are looking upon us, but that our body can't sit still because of the joy of God that, that we contain. How do we respond in a time of COVID restriction? When there are so many things we can't do, what are the things that we might do in order to bring good news to others? May this story, these stories, invite us to ponder, invite us to respond that we might dance, that we might proclaim, that we might become good news. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for the joy of dance. Thank you, God, for the courage of the prophets. And thank you, God, that the same spirit that was alive in David as he danced for joy was the same spirit that was with John the Baptist as he dared to speak truth to power, was the same spirit that is with the disciples as they go out in pairs to proclaim good news, is the same spirit that lives in us today, that we might become people of resurrection and people of dance and people of courage and honesty and faithfulness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Folks, let us continue in song. Community of Christ who makes the cross your own. Our currency be love and
Please be seated. Folks, because of COVID restrictions, we can't take the plate around and worship for our offering as we were accustomed to doing. Uh, but we still make sure each week we pray a blessing upon the gifts and the offerings that as a congregation we bring for the work of the church. There are many ways that we can do that. On our way out this morning, there is a tap and go on your left-hand side. If you have a credit card, um, it's something you're probably all familiar with at shops and other places. If you, it, if you tap the tap and go, money is automatically taken out. It's, it's $25 for each tap that you do and on the right hand side there's a little slot in the wall if you have cash that you'd in an envelope or a loose change that you'd like to put in the wall please feel free to do that as well. For those who are participating online and for others in our community we would encourage you to give using direct debit. All of the, the um, uh, one more, details around that are available online and, and we send them out weekly in our email chain, the account details etc. If you'd like to know more about that, please contact the church office and we can give you that information. Let us pray. God, we pray a blessing upon the gifts and the offerings that we bring. May these gifts go where they are needed most in the work of your church and the work of your mission. That those who are cold might find warmth those who are hungry might be fed. Those who are lonely might find fellowship. And those who are poor might find good news. Good news that liberates and makes whole. Good news that celebrates your coming kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Ian. Let us continue in prayer. Let us all pray. Oh God, thank you for the many blessings you have given us. You know the desires of our hearts and you answer them according to your will. Thank you that we are able to meet here together to worship as we acknowledge your love and forgiveness to us. As NIDOC, National Aboriginal and Islanders Day Ordinance Community Week concludes, we pray for healing of country. May we be as one as you call us to be, one with each other and one with the land. Help us to take action to seek greater protection and care of our lands, waters and sites that are sacred to our First Nations people. May we take time to listen to our First Nations brothers and sisters and seek to understand the spiritual, physical, emotional, social and cultural impact of land exploitation and desecration. May we be active participants in seeking to heal country and in so doing, may it bring reconciliation to our nation. Lord, open our hearts ready to love, perhaps those whom we have never stopped long enough to see, or those we have never noticed, or perhaps don't even care about, the lonely, the sad, and those who feel rejected or unwanted, those who are on the edge and are not accepted by us. We also think today of those suffering COVID, both here and overseas. Lord, help us to bring them by doing the things those in authority request to do. And so, in the words of the hymn writer, brother, sister, let me serve you. Let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I may have the grace to let you be my servant too. And so we pray for those suffering abuse or violence, as well as those suffering health problems. Give us open minds to take on the attitude of Christ when he was here on earth, to be ready to answer his call for us, to move, to take action, or, as we are doing, just sit and pray. 
May we be as servants, humble and obedient, ready to change. We pray, O oh God, you help us to understand your faithfulness to us. Often despise our indifference, maybe our ignorance. You know us and love us and call us to yourself. And now we ask you to be with our athletes who are getting ready for the Olympic Games. We pray you will keep our athletes safe from COVID in Tokyo and give them peace of mind, strength and the will to strive forward. Our Bible readings today remind us that you, O oh God, love the whole world. Lord, make us willing to change. And we pray for the church, your body on earth. We ask you to bless the work of Wesley Mission Queensland, to bless our ministers, the council, elders, and everyone worshipping here today or online. And we pray especially for our Wesley Mission Queensland services. We thank you that through their work, people's capacity to be independent is maximised in ways that provide the support and care that they need. We pray for the well-being of the staff, for continued encouragement and renewal in the wake of what can be hard and tiring work, especially in this COVID. We pray that the current COVID restrictions and the impact it's having on the different services with Wesley Mission Queensland bless and help those whom Wesley Mission Queensland seek to help. May we pray always for the furtherance of your kingdom as we say together the prayer Jesus taught us when he was here on earth. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Ian. Our final hymn this morning, The Lord of the Dance. I would encourage you to keep your clothes on. It's way too cold to do otherwise, but please... Stand as you're able and let's celebrate this wonderful song of resurrection and bodily worship. I danced in the morning when the world was begun And I danced in the moon and the stars and the sun And I came down from heaven and I danced on the earth at Bethlehem I had my birth. Dance then wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he, and I'll lead you all wherever you may be, and I'll lead you all in the dance, said he. Dance for the scribe and the Pharisee But they would not dance and they wouldn't follow me I danced for the fishermen, for James and John and They came with me and the dance went on Dance then wherever you may be I am the Lord of the dance, said he And I'll lead you all Wherever you may be, and I'll lead you all in the dance, said he. I danced on the Sabbath, and I cured the lame. 
the holy people said it was a shame they whipped and they stripped and they hung me high they left me there on a cross to die dance then wherever you may be i am the lord of the dance said he and i'll lead you all wherever you may be and i'll lead you all in the dance said he I danced on a Friday when the sky turned black. It's hard to dance with the devil on your back. They buried my body and they thought I'd gone. But I am the dance and I still go on. Dance then wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he. And I'll lead you all wherever you may be, and I'll lead you all in the dance, said he. They cut me down, and I leap up high. I am the life that'll never, never die. I'll live in you as you live in me. I am the Lord of the dance, said he. Dance then wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he. And I'll lead you all wherever you may be. And I'll lead you all in the dance, said he. Folks, just a reminder that we don't have morning tea next door. It's over at the Goldfinch. We'd love to see as many of you there as are able. Please stay safe this week um, and keep up to date with the, locus, the latest announcements from Queensland Health. Go deep within yourself and search your innermost being to find the dwelling place of God. Go to the ends of the earth and search the limits of your imagination to discover the beginnings of God's reach Go to the margins, the forgotten places, the ugly places to proclaim good news and the coming of the kingdom. Go and dance and celebrate the presence of God as the Spirit brings joy and wonder and life to your limbs. Go and know that God goes with you and that God's grace has already prepared the way ahead. In the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated.